I will start by saying that we are thrilled and privileged to have this exhibition on view in St. Louis. This is an exhibition rematch, a 40-year retrospective of Mel's work, and it was organized really deftly, beautifully at the New Orleans Museum of Art by the organizing curator Miranda Lash, who is with us today. Um, and I wish to thank the New Orleans Museum of Art and their director, Susan Taylor, we are, as I say, really, really thrilled to be on this train of Mel's show, which is pulling into the station of Houston and many other venues after this. So it is a show that has uh, different chapters and different lives and different cities. And um, I think that it's really important that it's here, not only because we believe so much in Mel's work and the contribution that it has made to the contemporary art landscape, but also because I think so many of the works in the show are so salient for who we are and where we are now culturally. And um, Mel is somebody who I think has able to has been able to make work um, within the kind of genre of social practice in a way um, that has really included a lot of different voices in a lot of different communities and really looked at the definition of authorship, you know, as an artist and how that can be distributed, you know, how an idea can be distributed in authorship. And I think that that's something um, that's really of interest to us, not only in our human condition, but also very much in terms of what is contemporary art practice. So um, with that, I'm gonna start with the first question. We've talked a lot about various pieces in the show, but I wanted to ask Mel, for my own edification, a little bit about the beginning of his career. So going back the 40 years and even before, um, where you studied, what you studied, what was the beginning of your art practice, what did it look like? And I'm particularly interested in the fact that you are a real maker. You make ceramics, you are an incredible draftsman. What did that come from and who was the beginning inspiration for this practice? Well, um, if you want to be an artist, you're always in the state of becoming. And, uh, and it would be delusional on my part to assume otherwise. Uh, there's never a case, and uh, even when I was in college at uh, you know, I got this scholarship to go to Peabody College. It was a national high school award. Uh, for a lark, I canceled out all the schools I was interested in and decided to go to schools that seemed challenging, like the place where I think uh, George Wallace tried to stop people from going to college. But I ended up at Peabody College for teachers, and even when they called me, they, um, they asked me, um, what I would like to know about the program. I said, no, do you have snow? Do you have <laughs> elevations other than overpasses and highways? And do you have seasonal change? Uh, because I wasn't even interested in that at that time. Because there was a delusion on my part that I already had it, even at that age. And then when you go into that realm. Because you grew up in just. Uh, well, you know, Houston, Texas. And as Towns Van Zandt would say, it's not the heat, it's the humanity. <laughs> and, uh, and so, yeah, that's enough to teach you that you better know something if you want to, to make it. At an early age, you're, 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 you have talent. And I heard by the time I was three, I was replicating the Sunday comics. But there was a period where in my life where I, I did have that. I spoke the other day, not flippantly, but or... Uh, or um, imaginarily speaking, that I had early childhood trauma. I dropped out of the, my mind dropped out when I was like 13 or 14. I lost, I spent a year with psychotherapy, I guess, or shock therapy for four months in a hospital bed without any comprehension. I was catatonic, yet ambulatory. I had lost sense of self-preservation. I was non-communicative, and I couldn't even take a bath or count to 10. Um, as a result, my parents kept me at home, and when I woke up, I woke up, uh, it was a year and a half, I think, before I finally communicated, and uh, chopsticks were dropping, and, uh, and um, I walked up to them, and I said, I, I was back. However, one thing that was apparent, my capacity to draw was lost. Huh. And I was looking at my own sketchbooks, and I felt like the key to me is me at that point. 
So any kind of delusion I had about having skill or so-called art because I could replicate things out of nature and just draw, I mean, even my copies of Leonardo or whatever, they're kind of somewhat 11-year-old-ish style. I couldn't even do that. And I have had to quietly resurrect that. I didn't tell a person, but it, still it was not art. Then I, already, then I already had a suspicion about all this, that this process we call art is mutable, it changes, and is evolutionary. So I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, let's move on. I'm not going to totally let it go. All right, we'll go okay. back to that. So okay. let's start with then some of the early works in this show right. and kind of um, let's talk a little bit about Cornell yeah. and Duchamp mm -hmm. and those kinds of inspirational things mm -hmm. and specifically you could, I don't know, let's talk about Magnolia, Magnolia's in the Moonlight mm -hmm. or some of the works that are at the beginning of this exhibition um, which really show a kind of evolution in work away from those kind of discrete objects but those discrete objects are absolutely wrapped up in art history. They're referential, they're singular, right. but they are referential, so. Yeah, well, uh, I can't, I, I entered uh, uh, the world of concept art, uh, again, having this, this um, preoccupation at, at, at school, I, I got into clay, you know, ceramics. I was so kind of wild, I mean, well, first of all, I didn't wanna, there's no way I wanted to get involved with pottery. I wanna be an artist. I want to be a painter or a grass person. I'm good. I'm competing with the, the, the instructors, right? And so I'm, I'm full of myself. And then I got to take this mandatory clay thing, right? So the, like the cake, the dirty, clay dirty. was like, yeah. Dirty, dirty, and shit. <laughs> but I remember this amazing instructor. We said, OK, I got to do this pottery or whatever, 101. And there was this guy, Robert Frega. He was the instructor. He'd sit in on a Don Wrights. He's from the Madison. Wisconsin school, it was at a, what they call a critique, you know? And at all this greenware, he wouldn't light anybody fire anything. And he held his finger on this piece, and he said, who did this? And he, I saw the tension of his finger increasing, increasing, oh until it broke apart. He said, if you're gonna make an ashtray, you make a damn good one. And he took that piece of uh, greenware and threw it into the water bucket and said, you hear me? I said, man, this is kind of good. So. <laughs> So I did make an ash. I did make some excellent ashtrays, <laughs> and uh, but then I got into it. I became totally psycho ceramic. Uh, I became the. I forgot about drawing. I forgot about painting. I I was in a perpetual bath of mud, and I would became the janitor of the pottery shop, so I could be there 24/7 to create that like a work out there, so I could master something I could not do when I started. What's the date of the urn that's in the exhibition? 74, 74, yeah. What is it? It is a, you mean the Western, it is salt, salt fired uh, stoneware. Um, and it is um, a concept I was already working on, which was to create a whole new dynastic tradition, looking at Song dynasty pottery and things like that, uh, and creating a whole line, private, like a secret project to create the stuff that I would bury and you could unearth and say, well, what culture was this, you know? So, <laughs> but anyway, because of that research, I mean, because of my, I got deeper and deeper into the ceramic traditions, into the Peruvian, and then into the, the amazing work of Japanese potters in, in like 3000 BC, the Jomon pottery, that uh, it became this incredible liberating experience that the deeper I got, the more I got into different types of philosophy. Some Japanese scholars, and the, some of these Japanese scholars had mentioned this guy named Duchamp. Oh, that's and interesting by, that it came uh, uh, What's her name? Uh, Woodman or Betty? Betty Woodman. Betty Woodman, yeah. Through Betty Woodman, you find this guy named Duchamp, and you said, well, well who the hell is he? And then the world is again liberated again. And you start looking at his influences. And then you find this guy named Cornell. And because you find him because of the connection with French symbolism. Because, you know, if you get influenced by somebody, it's not necessary to look at that person. You should look, know everything about that person, but then you can go look at what possibly influenced that person. And then there's this thing called alchemy. We won't get into that. But all of these early objects, 
even if they have something that you can point to like a ceramics tradition or like the influence of Duchamp, they're very layered for you. Yeah. Their meanings are very layered. They have a very particular iconography. They're dealing with either identity or history or uh, political history. Um, so go back to the urn for a second. The Western dynasty urn, um, what is it? What is the iconography of it? So well, I, I was imagining if, if there's a, and you know, it's kind of campy, you know, you have the long horn in there, you got this little Texas thing, then, you know, you have to wrestle with the places that gave you the most anxiety of your existence, you know, the one that really made you go crazy, so you got to deal with it. And <laughs> if you can wrestle with it and get it out of your system, you're lucky. And, um, and so that, that, that was a, the concept, was to also work on this textural fashion to create this, you know, to go where even glazes and form was, was not. What, what, I could not. what I didn't find, mm -hmm. I was trying to enhance. So it's just a, like, sulfur is a German tradition. And it's kind of dangerous and explosive. You know, you throw the salt in the kiln and it releases hydrochloric acid, you know, chlorine hydrochloric gases, so, you know, I like the danger of it as well. You know, the narrow, confined space and running for your life every time you fired. <laughs> it was kind of exciting. So, explosions. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, yeah. All chemical transformations. Absolutely. Um, the elements and what they can do are also a big part of your work. I mean, that has certainly continued, but you see it very much in the early work, sort of the elemental truths of the world as they're seen from different cultures um, is something that shows up a lot. There's a lot of smoke. There's a lot of fire. Mirrors. There's no, a no, lot of mirrors. Not too many, but I am working on one. But well, there are some in there. I know. <laughs> so also more. alchemy, let's talk about transformation right. for a second right. and alchemy, and then we can bring that to the transformation of objects, for example, right. in the weapons. Sure. But some of the early yeah. work. Well, the early work, well, there's, a, there's something called vertical palette, which is the, it's a stack palette. It is, uh, speaking of the Chinese alchemic tradition, or five element theory. You know, the Greeks, you know, you know what is it, air, fire, fire water, water earth. earth. The Chinese believe, have this different kind of relationship of uh, wood, water, metal, fire, earth. And they are in creative and destructive cycles. And that's where some of the understanding of Chinese medicine occurs and all that, you know. And um, so during this period of, of uh, immersing myself, not only, you know, there's that passage uh, uh, below as below, above, uh, uh, kind of prognostication of Hermes Trismegistus that even is alluded to in the large glass of Duchamp and even Smithson's questioning of him, you know, he's or saying, I see you're into alchemy. He said, oh yes, and that's about it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. so it kind of leaves you. But the, the, the Chinese tradition became very interesting to me because I think my own research shows that the, the, the Western tradition that Duchamp is talking about actually comes out of the Chinese tradition of transformation because it is this, this cycle of believing, because everybody made, guess what? Everybody always tried to pull the fast one. In other words, our fiction or making fake gold is a tradition that's been in forever. You know, let me give you this piece of lead and you give me some money. <laughs> you know, it's like modern capitalist uh, <laughs> kind of tradition. No difference. Uh, so, the, but that's, that's common. But what was happening in the Taoist tradition is this idea of immortality and these elixirs that could be created that would bring about eternal life and that the made gold is even better than the real gold because it had the capacity for this transformation and this uh, mutation of the body into in an incorruptible eternal state. Another fancy that was uh, aided and abetted by the heavy metal toxin mm -hmm. mercuric compounds that would make the brain code kind of, kind of wacky. You'd start seeing the fairies and you'd be flying <laughs> and that's even better, right? So <laughs> then we're talking about the origins of all religion and ideas uh, or religions based on hallucinatory practices and chemicals. But in your work, Vertical Palette, 
is actually kind of a lexicon of these yes. things, it right? Is the it's five. a vocabulary. It is. it is. So each of those bottles contains one of these five That's elements. Correct. And it is, and they can be arranged as in a rack, so it can be arranged in destructive or creative cycles as you wish. You see? So it's a variable, you know. So if you take this idea of transformation, um, which is so essential to all of your practice, and then you bring it to the transformation of objects. So we go from elements to objects. Mm -hmm. And at that point, we can really look at, I would say, all of the weapons. And I would put the nightstick in there, the gun in there, but also in a funny way, the straight razor. Absolutely. Um, the axe, the lecture mm -hmm. axe. Mm -hmm. uh, talk a little bit about this next phase of the transformation of actual objects so that they don't, they aren't what they seem or, they, or what they seem is complicated mm -hmm. by your transformative power. Well, I, I think, uh, yeah, the, you're throwing me because you say the next, because they don't I, okay. always come at It's the same not long. linear. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I kind of I, I feel that uh, once you understand that materials have this loaded kind of relationship with culture and ideas, then you, it opens up a whole other group of words or idea of materials to work with, then you can mix and match them. But then you go into the fact that there are, are just cultural um, assignations to these forms and shapes, and then that becomes another exciting methodology to explore uh, these connections. But usually, like the lecture acts is based out of a fearful kind of uh, confrontation with people who knew better, you know, people involved with philosophy or psychology. And I was fearful for my own capacities to articulate in front of them, so that's why that piece got made. But there's other ones, like the, like the Homo Cell 9 or the, or the Nightstick, that come out of an observation of the treachery of our culture that uh, pit each other against each other or pit ideas and, 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 and forms against each other and for power reasons. And then to subvert them by their combinations is, is becomes very important to me. Just for this audience, can you talk about Homiso 9 in terms of what the actual thing mm -hmm, is, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, you know, the definition of that object and right. what you've done to it? Well, it's a, you know, you know, Mr. Mr. Dog, you know. Uh, but it wasn't him, it was Malik, the young 16-year-old rapper that was in Pump Pump that says, you know, I'm strapped on your block with my Glock, ready to let loose on any imitator that I spot, okay? So uh, the Glock, the Glock, it's a Glock 17, second generation of Glock firearms that it was used um, by NATO, NATO and became this huge campaign in America out of Georgia to spread this weapon throughout its United States and one of the most successful marketing campaigns of weapons. And it is that weapon, that seven, it was the Glock 17 is one of the weapons, along with the Sig Sawyer that was used in Michael Brown, nine millimeters and that was pumped Mr. Uh, Diallo. Uh, these undercover cops let loose 41 bullets and when he held up his wallet when he thought he was going to be robbed and they butchered him with that weapon. And there's very little justice that can be found under those conditions. And I started looking at the, these weapons and uh, what they represent in our society. And if we talk about a gun, then we're talking about this incredible aura. And then we got to go to Benjamin, we talk about the, the aura of weapons in our society, how, it's how hard it is to confront this. So the making of art out of something like this required a different kind of thinking. Uh, the Glock, I felt, was so strong in its presence that there's very little I could do to make it into a work of art. So you have to go inward. And in this process, uh, I, took, I had to have someone, because of my former record, that was, we're not gonna, we'll strike that from the video. <laughs> we'll, um, edit, we'll edit that. Edit that we'll out, edit please. that out. Thank you, that's off the record. Um, I was unable to purchase them, but someone did buy them for me. And then we took them to the mean sh machine shop and we gutted every bit of the working mechanism out of it and then replaced it with a complete uh, gunshot trauma kit, a medical assist kit that would aid you, the more you deconstruct it using that good old theoretical language, the piece, the Derrida kind of language, the more you had access to the components that could save your life or someone else's. And I felt that was the right way to go. And it lar more than object, it's more about concept. It's like sometimes our transformations are necessarily covert. 
and must be buried in order to be successful. The peer pressure can be so intense that it's very difficult to change. Here I'm an artist and you're grilling me, so I gotta play this role, right? It's hard to break out of it right now, you know? We could, uh, but we're not gonna do it, don't worry. This is not a performance thing. Yeah, just sit That's there. on the record. Just sit here and stay calm. Just okay, sit just there. I hear a voice. Okay. Everything but anyway. is okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but, and then again, so because this came out of these observations, these theoretical observations, that isn't our world radically transformed by covert military, business, and political practices? More so than our vote. Well, I'm saying, you know, no matter what you believe. There are things that are about power and the operation of the state that must be maintained. And the hell with what you think. You see what I'm saying? So. I do, but I'm gonna ask another <laughs> question that's very specific because I do think it goes along with this. Okay. I, I wanna also talk about night wrap. Okay. And the actual form, again, the transformation. So right. like Homie So Nine. It's a little bit different. Um, uh, of course, you know, this was for an exhibition at the Whitney called black male, and you could spell it M-A-L-E, not M-E-L, so you know, it wasn't about me being black, so just get that straight. Uh, and uh, see, that's spelling, I, I did get that. <laughs> Texas education's finest, and, uh, and so. The views expressed on this stage are not necessarily those of the management. <laughs> Well, <laughs> you know, uh, number one, you know, so I remember, I press, uh, the name of that critic won't be mentioned, uh, but I remember a beautiful review in the Wall Street Journal said that Mel Chim was an artist that was such a dummy that I should be beaten with that nightstick for uh, <laughs> a lovely writing. Uh, what a hoe. But uh, anyway, <laughs> but it was because I wrote a response, and you know, just to, pawn of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, however, uh, it was because she thought I had added the kind of phallic embodiment, mm -hmm. and that's a total uh, not understanding. It is an actual monodonant PR24 nightstick that was used in uh, Rodney King and, different, and many individuals that, that I, I went to execute the surgical Lorena Bobbitt operation of precisely six inches. Uh, and to reinsert within it the complete working of an Audio Technica uh, 32, right, wireless microphone. And so you had the option to either sing or rap or to strike or rap upon a person. I believe that the object is of, of creativity or the object of, uh, or the possibility of creative expression occurs within that choice, that option whether to strike or sing. So it is the arc of that work. And there's an additional, um, for your television historians, that you look no further than T.J. Hooker with the fabulous William Shatner and uh, another Aaron Spelling production who you popularized the use of that weapon. You know? uh, and then you look deeper in, into the whole history of that form. And you find that it comes from a rice threshing tool used by the Okinawans until they were attacked by the samurai class of Japan, and all their weapons and knives and swords were confiscated, and they resorted to using their farming tools in defensive, oper you know, in defensive moves. So you have a object that is transformed from a tool to create you know, value or nutrition or, or farming kind of implement into, uh, you, you transform it out of oppression into the means of defense. And so here, after, of course, Rodney King, and of course, these kind of preoccupations with weapons and things, um, it transforms again into a work of art. And so, it, and giving another possibility that's not about defense, but maybe a, an op option that was not there before. You can click it on or click it off. You know what I'm saying? So, I'd like to switch gears slightly and move to another form of transformation. In this case, I want to talk about revival field, and I want to talk about the idea of the transformation of the landscape mm -hmm. um, and the betterment of the landscape, and also just learning about what is in the landscape, 
-hmm. And I keep saying this, but I will continue to say this, and that is that Revival Field, um, before we even talk about the details of it, Revival Field is a project that Mel undertook in 1990. And it is about the scientific possibility of phytoremediation. And the reason that this is so extraordinary is because I think this idea of how we clean our landscape for use, whether it's to live on in a healthy manner, or whether it's for urban gardening or for whatever, um, this is something I think that has very much come to the fore of our consciousness, particularly in urban areas. You know, I would say 2000, mid 2000s. And so I. I always feel that it is essential to mention that Mel's project in this regard um, and his collaboration with scientists started in 1990, which really does deeply, seriously predate a lot of the other work in this field, and he's such a forebear in this. So that's the one plug for it. It is, it's pretty amazing when you look back at the, <laughs> 89. Yeah. 89. I told you 90, but you know. So. So take us through that and what the you know original idea was and then how it um, manifested itself physically in these various sites. A lot of these projects occur out of a, um, a critical kind of moments that occur. And on this one, I, I you know, I, I, look, I don't know what your psychological profile is, but I do hear voices occasionally of myself, you know. It is the auditory hallucination that is, just happens. And I remember after, uh, uh, my first major retrospect, uh, not retro, museum survey at the Hirshhorn Museum in D.C. And I'm heading down in the elevator, we're taking down the show, and I always say I was busted, disgusted, couldn't be trusted, and yet you're thinking about your, your history at that point. And it's the first time, okay? And so I'm thinking, I said, okay, man, what you love? You know, I love making this stuff. I love making things and applying this research and connecting things. There's a, not another piece that was presented there called The Operation of the Sun Through the Cult of the Hand, which was a mythic, alchemic, scientific uh, exploration into Chinese, Greek mythology and psychology and different things. And um, so, man, I really dig this stuff. I could make my career in this. And the other voice says, stop. And I said, you say, say what? He says, stop. I said, okay. As I walked out of the elevator, I said, that's it. I'm done. So I go back to my place in New York, and I don't lift a hammer or a nail or paint or anything for about three to six months. And I just go to the library and look around the streets, pick up stuff, pick up cans, you know, they're five cents a piece now. And, um, and then, I stumble upon uh, something uh, by Terence McKenna. Um, I um, don't might know him, psilocybin expert, uh, ethnobotanist, that speak of a, a former plant that had maybe a possibility to transform toxic earth, and then I see it. I said, this is it. This is a piece. This is a sculptural tool, and the transformation of our ecology, uh, of an ecology that is dead to one that's living, is a possibility. And that's where it begins. It's a poetic notion that is thrown into the, your game, and then you are driven into exploring its reality, which I found that the plant that he mentioned had no, no possibility of picking up any toxins. And the research of this pre-internet was con a year of calling, writing, any experts in the field uh, borrowing money to pay for the telephone bill because that was the work. The work was to pursue the quest. So and the, the, the specificity of the quest was, is there a plant that, that can actually, fix our soil? That can or actually, can, can what? Can do this. Can, I can do this. Well, I finally um, found um, through a, uh, I went through all channels and, I, and there was a um, uh, landfill specialist who said, no, there's no such thing. And he said, wait, there is a guy named Rufus Cheney at USDA. Uh, he's a senior agronomist there, and he, he might know something. I heard a paper in 83 or whatever. So I call him, and, uh, and I mentioned the plan. He said, well, that will get you high, <laughs> but it won't do any, you know, anything to help your soil, you know? And he said, and he said but uh, I happen to know. I said, well, that's great. I said, what research are you doing? He said, none. 
He said, I have to stick with sewage sludge, one of the most glamorous preoccupations. Mm. Uh, no, it's important. It's very important work, but that's what he was asked to do. He was not allowed to pursue this research. So even then, it begins a, a, a kind of a covert quest because I can't reveal that he's working with me, but I can actually get the scientific connection uh, with him to pursue the first replicated field test in the world, which is to prove, help prove the scientific technology. Because up to that point, it was only in the laboratory that certain plants called hyperaccumulators had the capacity to remove toxins or heavy metals specifically from the soil. Knowing that their, their target specific plants, in this case, we're looking at zinc, uh, which is hell good for you, you know, you gotta go get that zinc, you know, um, but extremely toxic to plants. And cadmium, which is, is um, horrifically toxic to human beings, maybe 100 times worse than lead, okay? So this became the quest to find this plant. And, uh, so anyway, Dr. Chain and I uh, began this association. It was not a collaboration, it was a cooperation. So he's the kind of scientific back yeah. of what is happening. But what did Revival Phil look like in that first, in Minneapolis, right? Yeah. Um, and um, what was its kind of physical form, and then what were the points of testing it along the way to see what you could actually learn from it. Well, the forum takes that, you know, circle in the square, alchemic kind of form, you know, and the target form. And I did that purposely be to satisfy the formal art preoccupation or, you know, the professionals in the art world. Uh, in my mind, I understood that all that didn't matter. Dr. Chang said, just make it square, man. I said, <laughs> no, 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 we got to do this thing, you know. And it it's got to look good. It's got to look good. <laughs> it's got to look and, good. Uh, and, uh, okay, that, and even, so we, we separated 96 different experiments with uh, different soil treatments and, and really went into what could really give him the proper data. Uh, he postulated it'd be like $100,000 per year kind of testing. I think I was going after a $10,000 grant from the NEA uh, because there's nobody supporting this work within the... Uh, the government. So, uh, and uh, that was another complicated story, by the way, because it was the first one of the first grants in the history of the NEA to be rejected by the chair of the NEA. That was polite, and uh, and then argued for, and then we got that, and we began that the test, and that's a historic thing. I'm gonna look it up, whatever. But the the whole thing was was conceptually speaking, I understand, understood the levels that w of engagement. There's an engagement of formality that I thought might be necessary, and an engagement of my own kind of idiosyncratic choices, like creating these weird stakes with little heavy metals in the bottles that are tightly captured, so it could be like the carrot luring the metal out <laughs> of the ground. It's like, yeah. this is the freaky stuff you do even when you're not on drugs. And, 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 and so it was, it was something that was, um, was you got to make it a little bit exciting for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, so Revival Field became this form of circle and square. We, we did it. We did the experiment for three years and supplied the data to the USDA labs, lab number 007. And, and he was able to confirm in the scientific journals that this was true. The, f the NEA rejection was mentioned in the, 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 the leading publication, not Art in America, but something called Science. And this propelled an entire scientific community and say, hey, we, need, we did this first, you know. Uh, but unfortunately, it had already been mentioned that there's this Dr. Cheney and this artist trying to do this thing that the NEA hated. So um, that's part of the history. Cheney points to that science article as, as the fundamental source which liberated hundreds of scientists that were trying to figure this out. And so it's a historic document that Revival Field was part of. I don't think that answered your question either. No, it did, okay. actually. Oh, good. And it's, I mean, it's a very good m moment. I think it's always really interesting to go from something like Revival Field into a discussion of Operation Pay Dirt and the Fundreds, because I think this is um, the kind of project that is many, many years in the making, 
that begins with a particular idea or a spark and then becomes something that is, one hopes and does, distribute itself across the country to thousands and thousands of people that um, complicates this idea of authorship. Mm -hmm. and. It's a complicated project. There are many moving parts to it. And I think what's really interesting is when you walk into the galleries, you see this extraordinary, you know, sculptural piece of the safe house door and the palette with all these fundreds and people are invited to take part. But I do think um, it bears a real discussion about the one-to-one -one idea of financial exchange. Um, that there is not only a problem which presented itself that you wish to remediate, help, transform, but how you bring that from that kind of a concept to the idea of political will, political education. And um, so let's start with the beginning of Operation Pay Dirt in New Orleans, and then I want to kind of get at the heart of what happens when we sit at that table and we make a fundred? All right. Well, first of all, Revival Field, just to talk about time, uh, the only way that project could have excited my attention was that uh, I, I felt like uh, it could be a project that could be completed after I was dead. My own corporeal self could be expendable. If you launch an idea in the world and you give it enough supporting body of evidence, then there was a survival or sustainability involved with it built into the piece because of the power of the pragmatism and the poetic dynamic, uh, dynamic could be completed. Uh, Operation Hater probably begins after a talk at MIT when someone comes up to me and says, hey, you should be really cool and excited because they're doing you know, your revival field stuff in New Orleans after Katrina. I was already planning on going down because you, everybody wanted to, do, not everybody, I guess not all of us, but I wanted to go down to see what I could offer as a person, as a creative to what had happened in, in uh, New Orleans. And I said, they said, what would you say about that? I would say cease and desist. Because the, the, what I've learned from the scientists was so important that if you don't know what you're really doing, you're not going to help people, you know. First of all, once you start working outside of the context, and we learned it, you know, well, we have a generational kind of relationship in, in, uh, in our history, you know, of going out of the museum or out of the gallery, and then now we're dealing with people's lives. And that's what I learned from Revival Field. So when you're talking about people's lives, especially after a post a dramatic kind of situation of what ha happened in New Orleans, then I was doubly vigilant. I said, no, you just can't. You've got to know what you're doing. Before you offer people that have suffered so much, uh, you, you do not want to give people bogus opportunities. And this is paramount. And I said, well, i got to go. So when I went down there, I was traumatized by, or even taught a lesson of the, the limits of my capacity of creative process. Because after the interviews and after meeting people and going, so it was not just the physical destruction of Katrina, it was the, the social and psychological destruction of the people I was witnessing. I felt like I was inadequate to the task. What could I possibly do? Because I knew the challenge was something, the magnitude of what had happened required some of the equivalent magnitude to respond, and I'm not up to that. So I walked away. But then again, you walk back, you know, walk into New Orleans, because that's not good enough. You don't quit. And I kept going back, and I went back to what I knew, again, about from Revival Field, and began to research and found out this critical information that before Katrina, the, the soils and the houses and the conditions in the inner city of New Orleans were responsible for maybe 30, I don't know the exact percentage, 30 to 50 percent of the inner city childhood population to be compromised with lead poisoning before the storm. And that was, and then to find that there was almost, let's say a negligible amount of funding to support its, its, its transformation with all this talk about rebuilding New Orleans, I felt that something had to be done. And 
Operation Paid or, or the Thunder Dollar Pill, Bill Project was conceived within 30 seconds. You know, okay, no money, then we make the money. Does it have to be real money? No, because the people don't have money. Then therefore, it will be the hopes and the ideas of the, pe the youth, too, the most compromised. Is that a piece falling down? I don't know what that is. I think it's falling. Run. Uh, <laughs> That's actually not a very funny joke in a museum. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Don't you like quiet spaces to contemplate the work? But the, the, the situation required, you know, that, that understanding that um, if it is the young that are being compromised, where's their voice in this? And how can we celebrate the voice? It was understood that the authorship of this would be the people eventually as soon as they started drawing them, and that the responsibility would evolve to can maintain a focus on what the science might be about, to eventually deliver the voices, and then to ask for the exchange for the solutions that could be brought to the problem. So solution, practically speaking, comes with funding. That's what we're talking about, right? right? We're only talking about the money. And so each funded, you hope to exchange for a real hundred. Or that equivalent value into processes or, 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 or educational processes or remedial processes so that value could be, could be marked. Yeah. So you start this thinking about specifically the condition in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And this was in 2006. Six. In 2007. And we officially launched Operation Pater in the 8th Ward in New Orleans with the safe house that was created. And uh, that's where we began. So now it's 2014. Really? It's a long time. Uh, yeah. And thus far, you have accumulated approximately how many voices, how many hundreds? I'm sorry, I have to ask the, my co-producer on that project, Amanda, how many do we have now? 455,867, about there. Okay. 455,000 funded dollar bills, fundreds. 800. 867. <laughs> yeah. But the goal is 3 million. Yeah. And so this has proliferated to different geographic areas that have the same kinds of conditions as New or as you found New Orleans oh, I, I, to have. And to be clear, it, it started with the soil thing, but we realized that that would not be enough. That because lead is everywhere. Lead is everywhere. Yeah. It's when they open to the window to the flow. And if you open the window and you cut that's the, coated with lead, you could create the dust. And, and, and it's here in St. Louis. St. Louis is New Orleans. New Orleans is Cincinnati. Cincinnati is Cleveland. Cleveland is Oakland. Philadelphia is mm -hmm. Oakland. It's everywhere. So therefore, we have to begin to liberate the process of the funds in order to create something that can, in a unified fashion, bring about this grail that has been mentioned for so many years uh, uh, that 100% childhood lead poisoning prevention is possible, then why is it not done? So we want to dedicate the contributions of anyone who draws a bill toward that directive and not waver. So the last question for you, and then I want to open it up to the audience, is the part where you've kind of given away your authorship very purposefully, right? You're talking about this proliferation of voices. You want three million individual distinct voices to be a part of this. And that'll be 300 mil. And that'll be 300 million dollars, right? That's mm -hmm. the value. But somewhere in there, you, along with others, have to present these objects and these voices as political will, or to create well. the political will for the either education or the remediation. So what does that look like? Well, um, you know, it's a conceptual work. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I got out of it. Uh, no. <laughs> Yeah, the magic word. It's conceptual. Uh, no, uh, 
it is conceptual and strategic. I mean, it's an evolutionary kind of process. You, uh, like, I do see the whole project as is essential and honest that I separate myself as to be the delivery dude, okay? And not be the presenter or the educator of congressional leaders because what is being represented is your voice. If as soon as you draw a fund it, I work for you. I am obligated to deliver that because you believe that prevention is necessary. And plus, you have learned some tools that we have, Operation Paydirt has provided so you can be better prepared to deal with it within your own community. And we do the PSAs or the, the situation that, that you learn from, you are better informed. And then you volunteer or you offer this, this, this work to be exchanged eventually for the value of that possible transformation. Now, how we would like to present it, and we're looking at this again as the only word in the, the vocabulary of W that I have learned was the word strategery. Uh, and this strategery would be necessary to how do we approach a politician is with earnest um, reality by approaching someone with, who is a leadership of that community where the drawings come from from St. Louis, should we have this, if we get 40 or 10 or 20,000 from the city, we are obligated to meet, we feel, with the leadership of their representatives to inform them that this is a desire. And then after that, we have to show the evidence and the mapping, and luckily we are united in, uh, with uh, MIT School of Urban Planning uh, as our partner, one of the most, the largest urban planning school in the country who sees the value of this from an urban planning perspective that our cities are being compromised within these, all our cities are, and this could be a useful tool uh, of transformation. And they can present the mapping, the, the, the data visualization, say this is what it looks like, Congressman, Congresswoman, in your, that's affecting your constituents, and then offer our connections right now with national coalitions who have been successfully transforming conditions for the last 20 years, who unfortunately, uh, on a budget level, has been plagued with an insufficient amount for that transformation. In other words, uh, the childhood, even the CDC childhood-led poisoning prevention program that was set at 30 million was cut to 2 million a couple of years ago, enough to close them all down while the numbers have transformed that indicate a larger number of ch children are being poisoned on a daily basis throughout America. So it's just one of these realities that we're dealing with. So we would like to offer the opportunity for the leadership to know what they can do, okay? And it's their decision. Luckily, we have 50 states we're part of, so we have <laughs> some options to see who would <laughs> supposed to be the hero, you know? <laughs> And we want to be totally non-political about this because it's not about politics, it is the hopes of people that, that you, if you draw one, like I say, it is your wish. I don't want to get into who you vote for. Well, right, and it doesn't yeah, matter, doesn't right? Matter. It's, a, it's a health concern, right. not a political That's concern. That's right. And it is, the, and it, is, it is affecting the poetry of our, our existence. When you understand what lead does, it creates, you know, the two answers to all our woes, they keep saying, is education and crime prevention in our societies. Well, lead makes it almost impossible, you know, to have the proper IQ, really, to articulate things and to form your place. In fact, the monetary loss of cities is measured in IQ drop because you're That's not a productive member of your society. And this, this, this kind of behavioral violence that stems from the effect of lead on the human brain. So you have this situation, okay? We have a real, real situation in our cities. So that's where we're coming from. So it enhances my life if I do this work with you, okay? So I don't get that soapbox going. Don't get me started. <laughs> do not get me started, okay. <laughs>